We're going to get started. If I could have your attention up here, please. Great. Um, welcome to our Red Barn tonight. Um, tonight we're learning about composting with red wrigglers. Wrigglers. Wriggle, wrigglers. Uh, wrigglers. Willie Wigglers. <laughs> And all practice together. <laughs> but tonight's uh, Red Barn is a partnership between Wenatchee River Institute, Waste Loop, and Sustainable NCW. So you'll hear from folk, uh, from Amanda from Waste Loop, and then the presenter, Betsy, is a board member of Sustainable NCW. Yeah. Formerly Sustainable NCW. Yes, but yeah. <laughs> Um, so tonight we're going to start with our land acknowledgement that Wenatchee River Institute put together with the Pascosa Wenatchee people. So we're spreading the message that they uh, would like to be spread to the public. The land Wenatchee River Institute sits on is the ancestral homelands of the Shimpishkwashu, Pascosa or Wenatchee people. The Shimpishkwashu, meaning people in between, had villages positioned along the Wenatchee River. Their ancestral homeland extends from the Cascade Ridge throughout what is now known as the Wenatchee and Okanagan Valleys. The culture and economy of the Pascosa people centers on fishing. They also gather roots and berries, basket making materials and medicines, and they also hunt game. The Pascosa are named within the Yakima Treaty of 1855. Language to establish the Wenatchee reservation was never followed through, even with the needed surveying completed and many Piscosa now live on the Colville Reservation, 150 miles northeast of Leavenworth. And on the PowerPoint, you can see the reservation outlined in red. The Piscosa people are still alive today. They continue to practice their culture here within their homelands and are working to get land back. The Piscosa people are the original stewards of this land. <clears throat> and we offer this land acknowledgement as the first step to amplifying indigenous voices, and recognizing the harm done to them as a people. We encourage you all to learn more about the Piscosa people or the indigenous peoples of the place that you call home. The Wenatchee River Institute is committed to sharing this land acknowledgement and following up with other actions to educate and be respectful. Thank you. Um, tonight, our event is hybrid. So it's not just our friends here in person, but we have a camera and people are watching from home as well. And the event will be recorded and shared to folks who were not able to attend. So you can spread the word of that. Um, but hello to our virtual friends. And uh, if you have questions in the virtual atmosphere, you can use the Q&A feature or chat feature. And then here in person, if you have questions, we're gonna practice raising our hands. And that's simply because I have to bring my mic to you so the virtual people can hear your question. And then we just ask for kind patience because this just adds a whole nother technical layer to what we're doing and there could be difficulties. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, and then all these sponsors, organizations, businesses help us uh, run Red Barn events for free. So I'm just gonna read these out for you and um, yeah, show them support. Leavenworth Chamber of Commerce, North Central Washington Audubon Society, the Rhine House, South Restaurant, Sage Mountain Natural Foods, Ludwig's German Restaurant, Icicle Brewing, and Wild Birds Unlimited in Wenatchee, The Sweets on Main, Visconti's Italian Restaurant, Cured by Visconti, The Bubblery, Gibbs Graphics, Leavenworth Rad Tours, and Brunner's Lodge. Right. So um, these are just a couple upcoming events we have here at WRI. And um, some of them are with the same partners that we have for tonight. So starting in, uh, next week in April, we're continuing our seasonal guided nature walks and they're more focused on the spring. So they'll be happening on Thursdays and Fridays and that's open to uh, locals and people who are visiting here. And then on, on the same date next Thursday, we have a, another red barn in here and that's gonna be with Waste Loop and Winton, and they're talking about the community composting program that's coming to this area. So um, Amanda, who I'm gonna introduce in a second, will talk a little bit about that in her intro of Waste Loop. But um, if you're interested in learning more about that, that's also a hybrid event. So you can come in person or tune in from home. And last is our first annual Trash and Show, just happening on Earth Day 
uh, Thursday, April 22nd, and that is also in partnership with Waits Loop and Sustainable NCW, and also the Sustainability Club at the college, Wenatchee Valley College. So this, um, you can come and just watch the fashion show as people strut down the runway in their trash outfits um, or recycled outfits. And, uh, or you can actually form a design team and register and it's free. And uh, your design team would form the outfit and your model would wear it down the runway. We have one person who chose a specific song to walk down the runway mm -hmm. uh, with. So that'll be fun. You can do that too, if you want. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be a fun event outside over in the River House lawn. So everyone is welcome and, and uh, it'd be great if y'all came. It's our first one, so it's gonna be a hoot. Yeah, great. So I'm gonna pass it over to Amanda who works for Waste Loop and she's just gonna talk a little bit about who Waste Loop is. Well, hi everyone, my name is Amanda. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at Waste Loop. We are a local nonprofit um, here in Leavenworth and our mission is to inspire and transform our local waste streams into sustainable new resources um, in the greater Wenatchee Valley. So just to chat a little bit about um, some of our current initiatives, uh, you might've noticed that there's glass recycling just outside. And so when waste management kind of stopped accepting residential glass, uh, we stepped in to try and figure out a solution so that residents can continue to recycle glass. And so we accept glass at the Leavenworth Recycling Center on Wednesdays and Saturdays, and we haul it over to Seattle to Strategic Materials where it is recycled. Um, we also partner with Wenatchee River Institute to accept glass at these events. And then once the Leavenworth Farmers Market starts up in June, we'll be accepting glass on the second and fourth Thursdays of every month. So save your glass and bring it over so that we can recycle it. Uh, we've also been working with the Cascade School District on some sustainability initiatives. Uh, this photo here is the Middle School Sustainability Club, and we've been doing some waste audits. We're, we've been looking at the cafeteria waste, which is pretty illuminating. Uh, and then we've been working with the district level administration to implement mixed recycling um, across the district, which is really exciting, as well as doing some curricular development with various classes and students. Uh, our newest initiative is community composting, as Rachel have talked about, and we recently hired Natalie here um, as our community compost coordinator. And so starting in June, we'll be partnering with the Winton facility up in Coles Corner and starting several pilot uh, programs within Leavenworth to start, and then hopefully we'll radiate out to the larger valley but getting restaurants and the community on board with um, some drop-off sites. And uh, next week on Thursday, uh, both folks from Winton, which is the industrial composter, will be here to chat about their process, facility, and plans, as well as um, Natalie will be talking about what Waste Loops plans are for rolling out these programs. So everyone should come back on Thursday to learn more. And if you are interested in learning more or volunteering with our organization, you can check out our website or also email um, contact at wasteloop.org um, or chat with us after. Um, so up next, um, Jana from Sustainable NCW is going to come on up. Yeah, thank you. I'm, just, I'm not going to talk long, so I'll just hold this. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. I'm Jana Fishback, and I'm the executive director with Sustainable NCW. As you might have heard Betsy mention, we just changed our name from Sustainable Wenatchee to Sustainable NCW to better reflect the communities we serve. So we serve all of Chelan and Douglas counties. So we didn't want people to think we were just Wenatchee or something. So if I say Sustainable Wenatchee, it's going to take me a little while. So 
forgive me. Um, but I just wanted to share a couple of things. That was one of the big ones that we have a new name. Another is that um, we have our Earth Day Fair coming up in Wenatchee. It's at Pibus on Saturday, the 23rd from 10 to 2. So we'd love to have you there. Um, and then the last thing is we've got, it's a, li a little early to announce it, but we have something called the Waste Wizard that we're, we're launching. Technically, it launches at our Earth Day Fair, but you guys can have a sneak peek. Um, so go to our website at sustainablencw.org. And then under resources, you'll find the Waste Wizard. And it's been something in the works for a few months now where you can search anything um, that you're looking to reuse or recycle or get rid of anything uh, you might want to donate. And there's all sorts of resources throughout Chelan and Douglas County. So tricky things like glass or um, there's some composting tips in there. We try to really encourage reuse, but of course there's a lot of recycling vendors throughout the two counties that we include. So that's a resource that we would love to have you um, check out. It's kind of a pilot program right now where we're just, it's brand new. So if you see anything that doesn't look quite right, definitely get, get in touch with us. There's the email address there, wastewizard at sustainablencw.org. So you can get a sneak peek there. Okay, now I'm going to invite Betsy up. I'm going to be her little sidekick up here because she got me into worm composting. Um, so I might, our comedy act. yeah, we kind of do a tag team <laughs> thing here, but I'm going to let her wear the mic. Okay. She's the main show here. Oh, and I forgot to say, I do have um, business cards that have the Waste Wizard QR code and website on the table there. If you'd like to take one. I'm technologically challenged, just bear with me. Okay, good. So <laughs> I'm Betsy Dudash. Um, I am the board president of Sustainable Wenatchee. I am, let's see, I'm a Wenatchee naturalist. I write occasional blogs. I'm a landscape horticulturist and designer, self-employed. One of my clients is here, <laughs> Cherie. Um, and I have been composting my entire life and composting with worms since about 2006. 2005, maybe. I actually had an 11 year run with my first um, set of worms. And then my life kind of went haywire and it took a couple years to get back on track. But um, so I have some stuff here. If while I'm talking, if you want to look at worms, if you haven't seen them, yeah, um, I know some of you have, have looked at them. And this, I have some now dry from my compost bin so you kind of see what's going on and I made some warm tea this afternoon don't drink it <laughs> <laughs> and Jana brought her bin we'll talk about that and um, Amanda did a sample is it functioning it's a functioning now bin so so okay and I don't mind questions but with Rachel's rules you'll need to raise your hand right yeah, raise your hand if you have questions so um, we can do that. Ready. Okay. I need to stand up here. So, oh, this is, where am I going to, I'm going to use this. I can't really see that. Can I be over here? Yep. Okay. You can still see me? So why do you, why, why should we compost? And I'm going to hand this one off to Jana because she's, more qualified to answer from the sustainability um, climate change perspective. Sure. Well, especially before we had Winton and that exciting prospect, yeah. this is really the only way to compost your food um, in our in our area that's all year round. So some an option that you can do throughout the winter where things actually compost. Can you hear me okay? Um, so obviously you can have a tumbler outside or a pile somewhere. Um, that kind of has sometimes the problems with rodents or wildlife getting in there. And it really kind of just is a standstill in the middle of winter. You're really not able to compost much and you might get, you know, two feet of snow that kind of inhibit you from adding to that pile. So composting with worms is a really wonderful way to do it all year round. Um, why compost in general is, of course, just to keep uh, food waste out of the landfill, which creates a lot of methane. It's a uh, very potent greenhouse gas. Um, and so that's kind of it in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. And not only that, but when you compost with worms, within approximately two months, depending on how much you eat and how good you are at taking care of your little buddies, you're going to get really great organic fertilizer. Um, and it's not hard to do. And we all eat, right? So depending on how much you cook and what you cook, you 
you know, it's not hard. So we're gonna kind of go through the process and introduce you to worms and how they function. So let's see. So how much space do you need? So if you're looking at like Jana's system here, the, the newer bins are stacked so that the worms follow the food. So you have a top layer and you can add multiple layers. So this doesn't take up much space, right? So I think I say like six to nine square feet. Basically for your worms, you want room for the bin and then you want access and you want ventilation and it should be nice and dark and quiet, but it doesn't take a whole lot of space actually. My bin is substantially wider. It's, it's a little older, it's older version. I'm gonna get over here. Um, so it's about like this and it's in my basement and it's on cinder blocks. Um, so let's see, red wigglers have a, a best range as far as their, um, <laughs> as far as um, the temperature they function at and don't die at 50 to 80 degrees, roughly, you get down into the freezing temperatures and they'll die and above 80. So like our summers, they don't wanna be outside, they will die. Um, we'll talk about red wiggler specifically, but they're not native. They're not earthworms that burrow under. They actually live in the leaf, the leaf litter or the litter on top of the soil and that's what they eat. So they're more susceptible to changes in temperature than say, um, we all know what night crawlers are that live several feet down below. Red wigglers aren't like that. Um, so the larger your bin, the more room you need. I'm just gonna look at this. This will be easier. Um, and I didn't answer the question. Oh, so yeah, some benefits of compost, worm compost specifically. They're gonna improve the health of your soil. Um, Compost supports microbial activity, which is a really kind of misunderstood and ignored part of growing things. It's uh, that it's an important component for successful plants. Planting um, suppresses plant disease, helps the soil to retain essential nutrients and water, and not just essential nutrients, but depending on what you're putting into your worm compost, you can have lots and lots of trace elements that may be harder to get to fertilize for because your regular fertilizers are nitrogen, um, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But um, your worm compost will have a, all sorts of other trace, trace elements. So it's like taking a multivitamin that has kind of everything in it. Um, reduce soil compaction. If you have clay soil and you're trying to grow a vegetable garden, you definitely want a lot of organic matter in there and worm compost can help improves aeration. So with aeration, um, aeration is important because roots need air, oxygen, but they also need water. So those, those air pocket, those spaces, the intra, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, interstitial spaces between the soil particles become really important for roots to grow. Plants grow new, new root cells every single day unless they're completely dormant. But even in the winter time, until the, the soil is frozen, those plants are growing, those roots are growing down there. So it's important. Um, and obviously makes the soil more fertile. That's what they do. But, okay, so the larger your, your bin, the more space you need. Um, what do I say? I made this fancy thing, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can't see, <laughs> I can look back this way. Um, but um, when I lived in an apartment, if I had stayed in the apartment, my worm bin would have been probably in the kitchen closet. Um, I have a basement, so my, worm, my worms live in the basement. If you have an attached garage, it's better than a detached garage because you need some element of temperature control. You don't want it to get super cold and you don't want it to get super hot. Okay. So even in the summer, probably a, a Tash garage could get too hot. Yeah. 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 So um, basements are ideal if you have one, but a big closet space, a laundry room, as long as you, they're not near the washer and dryer, they don't like vibrations. They don't want to be disturbed. Um, 
they're, they're not as temperamental as they sound. <laughs> okay. I'm just letting Quiet, you know, dark. <laughs> <laughs> they just want to chill and do their thing. Right. Um, there may be restrictions if you happen to live in an apartment. Um, I don't know. I'm sure HOAs don't have restrictions for worm bins, but you know, that. you might want to find out. Any questions on housing? Okay. Uh, where are we now? So, so Janet kind of addressed part of this, but if you have outdoor compost, if you have a traditional compost bin or a barrel of some sort, why do you, why should you get a worm bin? And the Jenna already gave the answer, you know, starting in late fall until the snow is all gone and it warms up in the spring, your compost bin outside does nothing. It literally does nothing. And if you're like me, which, you know, I'm kind of a normal person. Don't laugh. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I, I'm not going to say I'm a normal person. I have uh, limited energy and limited time. An outdoor bin requires, even if it's just a barrel that you have to roll, that requires time and energy. If it's a traditional compost bin, it requires you to regularly aerate it, turn it. That's physical labor that we're not always in the mood for. Um, the outdoor compost needs to be watered here because we live in such a dry climate. And so there's a lot of labor involved. The good news for that is that you can ignore your outdoor bin as Rachel, we saw last summer, you can ignore it. And no matter what, eventually those materials will degrade. It's just a much slower process. So you just have to have more patience waiting for your humus, right? But with worms, we all eat, like I said, and depending on how much you feed them and how regu regularly you harvest your humus or worm castings, you have kind of a, an unlimited supply of fertilizer for plants. And it, within two months, like I said, you should have enough to make it worthwhile. I thought of another one. Yeah. And it's kind of why I started was that it's easier. You don't yeah. have to balance your greens and browns yeah. and know which is which category and that you have the right ratio. I got a really little tumbler and I guess with a tumbling system, it needs to have a certain amount of mass to really work well. And so I got like the smallest one possible thinking I'll just start it out and I never really composted yeah. very well. And so with worms, you, there are certain things you can't feed them, but you don't have to worry about this ratio of, you know, am I feeding them the right amount of yeah, yeah carbon versus, I don't even know, I'm not the scientist, <laughs> clearly, <laughs> and it's, high, it's easier. So high nitrogen versus high carbon. Yeah. So in an outdoor bin, you have to balance those. Yeah, worms are more forgiving. Yeah, they're very forgiving. So um, any questions on that? Rachel, you'll let us know, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so red wigglers, so when we're talking about red wigglers, we're not just talking about, oh, they're worms, right? No, it's a very specific species. Um, Asenia fetida, and there's their tolerance, approximately 55 to 80 degrees. I would say keep them above freezing and below that. Yeah, this says know. 40. But yeah, this yeah. says 40. Um, I would try to avoid exposing them to those cold temperatures because if you if you looked at my worms, Happy worms are reproductive worms. They're busy. They're just eating and they're reproducing and they're just like enjoying life to the fullest, right? That's just, they're doing their thing. They love it. Um, they are very prolific breeders. That's one of the points that they are. I mean, when, when my worms are happy, I know it. Um, as I said earlier, they live near the surface, which is where the food is. So they're going to eat your food on the surface of the worm bin. Um, that makes it easier to harvest the castings, which we call black gold, because look at it. I mean, look at it. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. It's just beautiful. And you're not spending any money aside from whatever initial investment in the, the system to get that. And it's a consistent source of really powerful organic fertilizer. Um, and I say they're not scaredy worms. Like you saw me, I can pick them up and they're not, you know, have you ever tried to hold on to a, a night crawler? <laughs> it's kind of an unnerving experience because it's like they would cut up their heads if they had them to get away from you, right? They're just, wow, ah, we don't want to be there. So red wigglers are special. And you have to, we think there's no local source, right? We're pretty sure there's no local source. Yeah, 
but there are sources and or from friends and family friends and family yeah. yeah i've given worms to yeah a number of people amanda has us i found three different vendors in washington mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> yeah okay okay i found three different vendors in washington and the handout that Betsy provided is on the Waste Loop website as a blog post and it includes links to those vendors. Yep. Just try not to order them in the heat of summer or in the bitter cold of winter um, because, you know. <laughs> but um, I always have worms and Jana might have worms. And Amanda, so if you, know, if you get to the point where you're ready and you wanna see if we have any, just send an email. Uh, odds are that I do because I feed them a lot. Um, okay, so what's the next step? So now you know about, you know about worms, right? You're an expert, right? Red wigglers, no problem, I can do this. So what you're gonna do is, you know, we have a couple samples here of different kinds of bins, but you need to figure out what kind of bin do you want? You wanna make your own? Cause you could Google, you know, worm bin and you can find limitless variations that you can use with, three gallon buckets or five gallon buckets or um, plastic totes or anything like that. As long as they're not clear. As long as they're not clear. That's an excellent point because they like darkness. So you don't want light to get in. Well, like an ant farm where you can watch. <laughs> yeah, you don't, they're like, they, if you saw mine, they're like all under the, you know, yeah, they're in there. Even like this lid off. They're like, no, they're like, down. what are you doing? Mom, don't do that. <laughs> Turn the light off. Um, so, so think about that. And if you're going to buy one, there is a guy coming to our Earth Day Fair from, or wait, Oroville. Oroville. And he deals in, he's a, he's a dealer. <laughs> he's a dealer. Yeah, he's a dealer. Um, I got my bin 15 years ago from Gardner Supply, and they still sell com worm compost bins. Um, what I would say is, buy the best you can afford because this is something that you want to last for a very long time because you will use it, trust me. And it's kind of effortless. Um, so figure out what's gonna work for you, the number of people, how much you cook, what kind of scraps you produce. And then I would size accordingly because you can always size up or get a second one if you find out that you're not quite you know, up to par. So mentioning the, uh, is it Barefoot Mountain? Is that what I it's called? think yeah. that's the name. Um, Orville is not close, as some of you probably know. There's not, that I know, of a local place where you can buy something like this. You can order from like Lowe's or Home Depot and have it shipped to the store, which I think is a little more eco-friendly than right to your house. Um, but yeah, there's not, as far right. as I know, a, a business that sells these kind locally. Any questions? You guys are so good. <laughs> no <laughs> questions. Okay. Um, oh, we have to get the, I left my worm bedding in my car. I was going to show you what I use. So um, ease of access, ventilation, good drainage. So drainage is something that if you're using or repurposing buckets or totes, you're going to have to provide some sort of drain hole, um, which you can either put a plug, put a plug in, I keep stepping off camera, or um, plug it with a cork and occasionally drain it off or somehow. But as you Google it, you will find myriad instructions and so options. And yeah, so contrary to- It actually doesn't smell bad. No, but that is called, um, that's the- Leachate. Leachate. I mean, that's what they call it in a landfill. Yeah, that's leachate. <laughs> that's not worm compost. Just not, so not let's clarify tea. that, yeah. or that's not worm tea. So <laughs> yeah. to clarify the difference, worm tea is when you take finished compost and you put it in cheesecloth and then you soak it in water and then that gets the, the nutrition out and then you can water it and give your plants some nutrition at the same time. Like I would use this for house plants as opposed to giving your house plants this, you know, right? But you can also give house plants watered down leachate. Uh, just probably wouldn't necessarily use that to like fertilize your vegetable garden here because 
Remind me how this works. So, so the, the possibilities, bless you. The possibility is that, um, so that is basically, some of that will be actual, you know, worm urine, right? Whatever they have. Um, I don't think it's technically urine, right? Uric acid. Bladder? I don't think but, so. No, they have no bladders. <laughs> but, um, but there is waste that comes from them, liquid waste. But there's also waste that comes from the, the food scraps you're giving it. Or yeah. yeah. So, so um, I usually drain mine before I put it in there, but we're talking about soggy, rotting food a lot of the time, which has a lot of moisture in it. So that drains off. And the issue is with the leachate is that um, it may contain undesirable elements depending on what, what's in there. Like, could there be trace, you know, heavy metals? Who knows? But so um, we're encouraging you not to use that on food that you're going to eat because you just don't know what's going to go into the soil and then get taken up by the plants. Thank you so much. Yeah, until very recently, I thought that this was the same thing. Like this was compost tea, but at some point Google taught me I was wrong. So, <laughs> so but you will get a lot of this yeah. um, because... Well, let's let's stay on point. Sorry for those at home. Yeah, we all concur. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't have a bad smell. We might it, think compost is you know bad smell. But it's not. So um, so you figured out what kind of bin you got, you want to get, or you've got it, and you figured out where you're going to put it, and then you need to make preparations for your worms. So you're going to get the bedding ready, and in my case, I use um, shredded paper. Just if you have a shredder at home, an office shredder. Um, you take that, and when the worms are first arriving, you want to get that a little bit moist. You don't want it soggy, but they, they want a moist environment. I think their ideal humidity is about 80% humidity. Um, but you'll see it can get a lot higher when you're adding wet stuff to it. So you're going to get that ready. You're going to order or obtain your worms. Then you're going to put that bedding in your container, you're gonna put the worms on top. So if we were gonna demonstrate, I would take some of my worms and I would dump them on top. Then I would give them a container of food and then I would cover them with dry bedding. So when I feed mine, I always cover them with a layer of dry, okay? But we'll talk a little bit what more about that. Bedding option? Um, coconut coir, if you buy, you can buy like the bricks of coconut coir, which is the outside of coconut shells. It's just a, a, normally it's a waste product, but there's a lot of agricultural and horticultural uses for it. Um, you could use cardboard. You can use, Jenny uses newspaper if you get the newspaper. Um, people have expressed concern about whether, you know, the ink is petroleum based or soy based. And in my opinion, I think it doesn't really matter because there's just not that much there. In, in larger terms. And I think that most print um, inkjet printers use soy-based ink these days anyway. So if you're shredding office paper, you're probably okay. You can use um, paper egg cartons, kind of tear those up and put those on there. You can tear up cardboard, anything that's kind of leaves a leaves. If you have a yard and you have dry leaves, those are a perfect addition to your worm bin. In fact, when I started mine, I had saved up some leaves. So you'd get them wet to start, yeah? To start with, um, just to start with, because you want them to be in that moist environment. And what else? Okay, so, and then you're gonna, I kind of skipped ahead to getting them all ready, but you have to save your food, right? Your food scraps. So Jana has one of those nice countertop bins with the lid, so she fills that up, right? It's like a stainless steel thing. Yeah, with like, a filter. Yeah, I've got a filter on the top. I, I use um, cottage cheese containers because I love cottage cheese, <laughs> right? And you can't recycle them. So I use cottage cheese containers for my kitchen scraps, but um, there's some food that you won't give the worms, which are, well, we'll talk about it. I don't wanna jump ahead. So I have, I keep one container for stuff that's going to the worms under the sink. And I have another container for stuff that's not going to the worms. It's gonna to go to my outside bins. And then I have a separate container just because this is how it works for me for tea leaves and coffee grinds. I drink a lot of tea. 
So I have those kind of going on. And the most important thing that I want to stress is you're going to figure out what works for you, kind of incorporate it into your, your just the, the things you do, your habits. So instead of throwing food away, you're going to be like, oh, that's for the worms or, oh, just made a pot of tea or whatever, whatever you do, you're going to start saving that because the worms have to eat. That's the thing about worms. They have to eat. Get ready to yell at your roommate or your spouse or partner for that, that goes what is, the worms. <laughs> yeah. I found a banana peel in the garbage oh, three man. weeks ago and I about <laughs> lost it. <laughs> what? Have Thank you me. not learned anything? <laughs> anyway, so you, you might be become a little protective of your little <laughs> friends and their need to eat. So, um, but anyway, you want to save those. Ready? And then you're going to get the red wigglers, however that happens. Okay. Any questions on the process? Okay. Hold on. <laughs> Who's first? It just says one container for new food and one for moldy things. So when you take something out of the refrigerator, that's like a science experiment. You can give that to the worms. I wouldn't give them cold food. Um, I'd let it, yeah, but yeah, um, definitely mold is something they seem to like a lot, like crazy, disgusting molding food, because I don't, um, sometimes I'm like backed up a few containers before they need to, to eat. And it's, you know, it's really gross. Or the, the coffee grounds and the tea leaves have that white filamentosis kind of mold. They love it. You're not going to hurt them. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. Sorry. A question I would have is: assuming you have a system that the same size as your bin set, set up over here, you've got your drain, you've put a cork in it. How often are you going to drain off the? Was it leachate? Yeah, I actually just leave mine open. I think in the instructions when I got it, it said I just keep a mason jar underneath it and leave it open. Okay. And if you know, you can kind of tip it and get it to come out. And I was just kind of checking to see underneath how what it is, because sometimes you'll notice you do need to kind of clear it. Um, but it's it's, it's not good. Too gross in there. Um, I have a horror story about mine. So mine has a has an opening. It doesn't have a, a spout. It's just got a hole. Um, and my policy, well, how I do it, I just take a a little bamboo stick and I like punch clean it open, and I have a big. Um, measuring cup under it at all times. Although it's sitting on a tray, but still I wanna catch that, right? And lately there's a lot of liquid coming out. But last year, I, I couldn't, it was last late last summer. I went to, I was trying to unplug it and it kept plugging up again. And I'm like, cause I don't really empty it out very much cause it's a, the kind I have is a lot harder than the stackable units. So I took off, which is probably 50 pounds, took it off, set it down, and there's a bottom. So it's two, two sections. This top fits into the bottom. The bottom catches the water and drains away, right? What I had down below was, it was basically full of a slurry, is the best word I can use to describe it, of humus and liquid. So there was no way I was going to get just separate the liquid out of it. So I ended up scooping it out into containers, taking it upstairs and outside and feeding all of my tomatoes and peppers. But it was a mess. And I was like, yeah, I probably need to empty the bin out more often. Um, you get busy. So it's an excellent question. So that it's important because your bin is more likely to get too wet then not wet enough because like I said, you're putting wet things into it. The, the food waste you're putting into is wet, which is why when I feed mine, I put a generous layer of um, shredded paper on top. So you but, can see if you, well, you guys can yeah. afterwards, um, but there's, they call this, I think the worm ladder or something to make sure they don't get stuck in there. They can crawl out. I do have a worm down there. This probably could use the cleaning. But there is some liquid down there. It's just not high enough to go down the spout. So if you wanted to, you could kind of tip it out to if you're ready to fertilize your house. For that system. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Mine isn't um, that advanced. But I mine just is leave yeah. Mine, yeah, open and then yeah. it just drains as, as needed. That's an excellent question because that is where your system will fail, is the too much moisture. Jenna, Jenna and I have both experienced um, the little uh, fruit flies. Fruit flies. Um, and that will happen if you're not 
putting enough paper or whatever in there to absorb that excess moisture. They'll be like, woo, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you'll hang, uh, what I did was I, I hung fly strips all over the all over the basement until I captured them also all. Also the source of a marital argument. <laughs> <laughs> I got these worms, honey. And then all of a sudden you have house or, you know, fruit flies yeah. everywhere. So, yeah, but it's a learning experience. Yeah. Okay, so. We haven't talked about what to feed them. Yet. So we're gonna talk about that next. How much time? Oh, good, we have time. So feeding them. So I'm gonna stand over here. Can I stand over here and read? You're gonna, like I said, drain excess fluid off before you put it into the worm bin. I ha happen to have a big laundry sink in the basement. So I drain it off and I move, I make space and I dump it and then I cover it and I add some bedding to it. So the things you want to feed them, they love eggshells. If you look at my here, you'll see, there's a lot of eggshells in there. So pretty much any food waste except citrus, onions, garlic. Anything too acidic. Anything too acidic they don't like. Um, and the other big no-no from personal experience, don't give them tomatillo, tomato, or pepper seeds. You want to know why? <laughs> It's because if you're, a gardener. if you're a gardener, which is so unlike traditional compost, which when it's functioning well, it heats up to a certain temperature and kills the seeds. So seeds are no longer viable. Worms don't do that. They just like ignore them and the seeds are there and they're definitely still viable. Um, perfect example. The first time I used my worm humus as seed starting um, material, because it's, it's high nutrition, right? Why not, right? Be great. I ended up with cell packs because I was just reusing cell packs of 30 to 40 seedlings of tomato, pepper, tomatillo of unknown varieties all crammed together because they got daylight and, and they just went, they exploded. So when you're, you know, cutting up peppers, seeds go into your outside compost. Um, any tomato waste aside from the core and tomatillos, they need to go outside. I'm a huge tomatillo fan. And, and once you plant one tomatillo, you'll never have to plant them again. Um, but um, so that's just a tip. It's not that they're going to harm the worms or do anything, but they're going to um, be a distraction in your gardening efforts. Okay. They definitely love coffee grounds and tea leaves. Okay. What else? Do they love pretty much it. Oh, so no processed food, dairy. Yes. Yeah. And nothing hard. If you look in here, I have, um, we have an apricot tree and some apricot seeds. They're never going to break them down. So don't give them avocado seeds or avocado husks. Rind. A rind. Oh, rind. <laughs> the other day we were like, what's the correct oh, word for yeah. the outside of an avocado? Rind, I think, is correct. They love bananas. They love potatoes, everything like, like that. Corn cob. Corn cob, it'll yeah. just sit there. Yeah. yeah. If you put it in your outside compost, it'll probably take a couple of years, two to three years to eventually break down, but it will. Um, and then in my case, because I use plastic containers, I rinse them out in the laundry sink and then run them through the dishwasher and I can have a stash under the sink. And it's just, it's just routine now. It's just part of the cycle. It works. So I don't, it, it probably says up there, but um, no meat, dairy. Right, no meat, dairy, food. grease. Yeah. yeah. None of that stuff. And go in the future and tin composting, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. And if that's. If you chop it up or grind the food, it'll rust it faster. Yes. Yeah. You theoretically want it fairly small. I've put whole, you know, whole banana peels, yeah. whole. You probably don't want like a whole potato or something, but you don't have to like dice things up for your worms and prep it. You know, first I kind of did that, but they'll get through it eventually. I actually have put whole potatoes, like oh. whole rotting potatoes and, and just, and just, I just throw them in there and there's enough of them and there's enough space. They will do it. Yeah. Cause I'm, you know, I got other stuff to do than chop, <laughs> you know, I'm just like, okay, yeah, you'll take it. I love them, but not that much. I'm not going to cook for them. We had a question from the Zoom 
Okay. Look. And uh, the question is, are mites ever a problem? Not in our experience. It's What's a mite? So mites, they're these little tiny insect things. I've definitely seen non-worm insects in mites. Okay, so nothing that's ever become a problem. Right. Except I had fruit flies once and I had some other variety of fly once. Um, I think they maybe were at the same time. They are, they're the and other that one. that was my fault because I failed to, as you'll see here, you, you need to keep it covered. She uses um, shredded paper. I just use a layer of like comics. I, actually, I don't. Just turn it. Yeah. Here. So you do need to, to have a layer of something on top. That otherwise, you'll have other yeah. pests. Um, but yeah, I've never had anything that's problematic. Yeah, yeah. I think. Mites are like the... Good <laughs> Don't make me say it. Sorry. She said mites are good for healthy soil. Well, healthy soil yeah, has. Sure, there's things in there that. Oh yeah. yeah we don't, there's we can't see all sorts of bacteria yeah. and stuff happening in there that we really don't want to know about. We <laughs> we can't see it. So how are you going to keep your wigglers happy? Um, it's pretty easy. You need to feed them regularly and. Regularly does not mean on a daily basis. In my case, I feed them probably weekly. Um, I go down to do laundry and I'll check on them and I'll give them a, a, something to eat. Like I said, in my case, I just, I have a little shovel down there. I move the bedding aside. I dump it, spread it, put the bedding back and add another layer of bedding. It's really easy. Um, they can go weeks without being fed if you feed them. I had foot surgery last February before my foot surgery, because I knew I wouldn't be able to go down the stairs for several weeks, I made sure they were well fed. But at some point, knows nothing about worms or plants or stuff like that. He's a pharmacist. I said, will you please go feed the worms? So he said, I fed the worms. I'm like, okay. And then when I was able to go downstairs, I found a layer of food approximately that deep. He had <laughs> fed them everything, but it was okay. Um, what you have to remember is that your worm bin is a closed ecosystem, um, basically. So if you feed them more, they will eat more and reproduce more. And if you cut back on the food, there will be fewer, you'll have some die off. So you want to kind of do it on a reg, kind of be consistent in how you feed them. So you're not having those extreme changes in the population. Mine are happy with, it's benign neglect, which is one thing that makes worms so wonderful because you just have to acknowledge their presence, you know, once a week or yeah. every 10 you days or whatever. You two week vacation yeah. and not worry. And, and know that they're going to be okay. Because we all go on a lot of two week vacations. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, we don't. Other people here do, not us. Um, and like I said, making sure it's not too wet inside, that's going to be critical. So using that drain with something under it and adding plenty of bedding should take care of that problem. Um, and because mine isn't like this, if you're, if you're going to get or have just a straightforward bin, how I deal with um, eventually emptying it out or partially emptying it out. I feed them only on one side for a couple of weeks. So the theory is that they will migrate over there. It's not hundred percent, but after a couple of weeks, I'll shift it over and I'll scoop out a bunch from one side. And as I do it, there are always worms because when you have a large enough population, they live everywhere in your bin. They just, they're there. So yeah throw them back in, and then sometimes you're not successful. Like um, I had this sitting in an old kitty litter container since last fall, November. since last November. When we were, we did the same thing Saturday morning, there were still worms that were alive in there and they were just really skinny and not the healthy ones you saw, but they were like hanging on. <laughs> so in the summer, when I dig it out, um, I take it out and I top dress my plants and I keep it on the porch and I keep the lid open so they're not gonna overheat, but I have a, a back porch so it's shaded and it's, it's not too bad, but there will be casualties. You should understand this. They might live through the summer in your garden. Right. They'll have a good little life. Yeah, but yeah. there's no way to prevent casualties. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's just the way it is, okay?
So I have a question. What is the life expectancy of a worm? And presumably they're dying in there. Are they eating one another or how does that work? I have no idea. You I don't see dead ones. No, unless you so they dig them out. Somehow that yeah. may be some cannibalism. I don't know. <laughs> No yeah, idea. I don't know the life expectancy. It's probably not very long. Google it. <laughs> You've mentioned layering, but I've only heard about the top two, like eat them from the top, scoop the gorgeous stuff out of the bottom. Why do we need more layers? Mm -hmm. And That's uh, a great question. yeah. And that's yeah. yeah, yeah. So you want to answer that one? Sure. So yeah. you have the layered system essentially to let the the one process. So you can, if you continue to feed it, it's never going to reach this black gold status because you're always going to have half decomposed food stuff in there. So you only feed on the top layer, and it's mostly to let this sit and kind of continue to process. So you do have some worms in here, and as soon as they aren't going to get any more out of this and they've kind of, you know, done all that they can, then they'll kind of migrate up. Most of them live in the top layer where you feed them, but you will have some in here. Like as I dig through here, you know, I can see just a few, they're probably pretty far down there because of the light, but, um, and then you can continue to add if you, if you have enough volume of food, you know, and you need to keep adding because you filled up your next layer, you can go up to, to multiple layers. The other nice thing about, man, this doesn't smell as wonderful as I was saying. Oh, it doesn't smell bad. It doesn't smell that great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're being filmed yeah. um, the other nice thing about the layered system is that when you are ready to harvest this it is a good way to, to to essentially expose them to light they'll go they'll move away from it and so you can kind of stir it up and make them move down and put another layer underneath with the bedding and have that ready to go um, and so then they'll kind of you can just leave the lid off for a while and stir it up and they'll move their way down away from the light and then you can more easily harvest them out of there. But if you're producing a lot of food, you can just keep stacking them up. Mm -hmm. And then as you need this, you lift it up and you take it away and use it. Even in the middle of winter, you know, you're yeah. saving it for your garden. Yeah. Um, I, would be, I think I would be happier with this system. I mean, my worms are happy, but the, the, the process of getting that, those castings out of there is just, just it's a lot of work. And you could do something similar with this. Right. right? You can keep adding a layer. With yeah. Them, you know, that a lot. yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. Great question. I have a Zoom question. And I think part of this we already answered, but I'm just going to read the whole thing. Are there any local sources for red wigglers? And do you ever just get some red wiggler fishing worms? No, because um, <laughs> as far as we know, there are not. Um, and unless they really are red wigglers because I think most fishing worms are night crawlers or other species, which live deeper in the soil. So they do, they function differently. We have this question because we tried to source some so we could give some away. And it sounds like whatever you might buy as bait are not ideal composting worms. They may be past reproductive age or just not, and, and they're very likely not red wigglers. Right. Because um, these are actually pretty small. If you can come see them you know, later on, they're, some of them get pretty long, but they're not the big fat earthworms you right. see. No, they're skinny. Yeah. So how do we use our castings then? So like I said, you can use it in your seed starting mix, just, you know, make sure there's no seeds in there, right? But it's very, it's very high in nutrition. Um, and one thing, yeah, add it to the soil when you're transplanting. I like to top dress, like throughout the season, like once a month or so, I'll top dress, which means because I'm speaking horticulture, it means, so here's your plant. Plant, take some of the castings and just put it around in the soil around it and kind of work it in a little. And as you water, as you water, the nutrients will just get taken down into the soil and any worms or other creatures that are in the soil will kind of take care of that organic matter for you and it'll go away. It'll just kind of get pulled down into that whole terrestrial ecosystem underneath. Um, side dressing, that's what I do. You can add it to the soil. And I did a lot of reading on this after my foot surgery because I spent a lot of time in bed. And I think the entire, if you're looking for like the optimal planting mix, like to, to grow the best you can grow, it's some crazy high percentage of worm compost to the other soil mix. Um, 
I don't want to give you a number because I don't remember it, but there is a, a professor at NC State who her whole research area is worms and worm composting. And you can watch her YouTube videos and read about it. And she throws that number in there. I want to say that it's at least 30% compost in whatever planting mix you're using. And that'll be like for optimal growth. If you're like producing veggies or something and you want it to be great. I never do that. I just use it as a soil additive for fertilizer. Um, here, so I brought the compost tea. So compost tea, as I showed you earlier. So that's, and then you could use this liquid for seedlings because I have some seedlings that, are, that I've started and they were in quar plugs. And then I put a mixture of um, quar and something else. So they're not gonna get huge amounts of fertilizer from what they're in, but when I help them out with this, It'll be like a little, little boost of energy for them to grow. And for indoor plants, this would be what I would use for house plants for sure. And repeat as necessary during the growing season. I mean, you can't over fertilize them with worm compost. If you were using, let's say a synthetic lawn fertilizer, you can easily overdo it and destroy your soil and burn the plants and bad things happen. With something organic like this, there's no such thing as too much. So you don't have to worry about that ever. And there we go. I wanted to make sure we answered that Zoom question. Yes. So there aren't local places where you can buy that we on, know of on the Waste Loop website. And there's a, a brand new blog, and mm -hmm. that has all this information in three places you can buy them um, within in Washington, the state, of Washington state. Yeah. So they'll mail them to you. Yeah. And now is the perfect time of year because they yeah. won't get too hot or cold. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unless you know someone who has a bin and their worms are doing great and you can say, hey, yeah. I've given worms probably to four people at least that I remember. Three, yeah. yeah, so we can do that. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Um, given normal eating habits and composting habits, how much black gold do you produce in a month, in a year? I don't know. Um, a lot. <laughs> with two little kids for her you'd think that, that would mean that they eat less but they are such picky eaters that <laughs> we compost a lot of what they don't eat and this top layer i think i started um february 1st is when i did so it's maybe half full you can come see it in a minute um so and then this one i wish i need to like label the date so i can remember when i started this one i think this one's probably been at least six months so yeah it depends on you know, size of the people living in mm -hmm. the number of people living in your household. Um, I always have plenty in the growing season to give to whatever I want. It's a, for me, the limiting factor is disturbing the residents of my bin. I mean, I'm willing to take I'm half sorry, of it. Are you talking about like the amount of worms or the amount of black gold? Yeah. Of black gold. Okay. yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah. So yeah. it's dependent on um, how much you're feeding them. Yeah. Really. So if you, I'm if sure you cook you, a lot, I'm sure there's, you could find out like yeah. a certain amount of, you know, fresh produce to how long it takes. And how like, long. would it be easy to fill a five pound bucket? Oh, I imagine so. I would say you could do that within two months, I would guess. When did you start yours? Do you mean with black gold? Yes. Like with what yeah. you're going to put into your garden? Or... I, I definitely can. So when I go to empty mine, I will easily half fill a kitty litter container and still have half of the bin left within just a few months you yeah think? yeah yeah um because i is it can you overfeed the worms i mean no so so like i said because it's a closed system, you feed them too much they will eat more they will reproduce more but if that food source drops, the population will drop too. I would too. say you could, if they can't keep up with it, it will mold and it will just kind of rot. Like the, the stinkiest part of this, I feel like I'm talking a lot about smell, but um, <laughs> the, the you know can that I have that stays under my sink, that's the only part that really smells bad is that it just has rotten in there. And it's when I feed them that it you know can smell bad. So I just totally lost my train of thought. Um, so you could, well, you possibly i mean you oh, have yeah. to like it, go crazy if you if it just sat on there so that they couldn't process it fast enough i think you, you 
It could just be a smell. Problem, if it's honestly. an occasional thing, like when when Teddy overfed my worms, yeah, was that it crazy? was no big deal. Oh. I mean, it just took them longer yeah. to eat that, and eventually they did. Mm -hmm. But if we made a habit of that, probably not a good thing. But yeah, like, you know, they lived on that for three weeks easily. Yeah. Any more questions? <laughs> um, how does the five gallon bucket contraption work? Yeah, so here. Together. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, hold on. It's in my pocket. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So um, these are old sauerkraut buckets. They leave them in their back alley at Moonshin House so that it's a really great sure, way to reuse something and it's free. Uh, so this one is just a regular bucket. This collects that leachate. Um, and then I drilled holes on the bottom of this one so that it's able to drain the excess moisture. Um, and then there are holes drilled along the top and on the lid um, so that there's enough aeration and airflow. Um, and then I also use shredded paper for my bedding. Um, and there's what you can see inside. Uh, I have an, another bucket that is the exact same as this with the holes on the bottom. Sorry. <laughs> um, and I haven't stacked it yet because I wasn't sure if it's ready. Um, so that's, I just started this like in January. So it's been an experiment. And I was gone for a month on the Grand Canyon and I just fed them a lot before I left. And they're thriving. So low maintenance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They really are low maintenance. Um, and it's a super low footprint and it's also portable. Yeah. So this will be coming to all the farmers markets with me this year. Brought it to the high school last month. So traveling worms. <laughs> yeah. So you just put another bucket. Oh, she asked, how do you stack it? Um, so you just put another bucket that has holes drilled on the bottom so that the worms can migrate up. Um, through those holes, similar to this. So when you add one to this, it will kind of just rest on the top there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you put, use the same lid on the top of the next bucket. Yeah. You can get those buckets um, any of the grocery stores that have a bakery because they get frosting. So oh yeah, lots of restaurants and restaurants. grocery stores are great mm -hmm. supply. Mm -hmm. Breweries. Yeah. So what size holes did you drill in the bottom? Are they like quarter inch? I think. I think they're three eighths of an inch. Okay. Sure, it's not. Yeah. Be specific, but, but generally, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. When, and then how many? Holes? You'd want them to be big enough that the worms could get through when you start to add layers, so they can migrate. Just, uh, yeah. This amount. Um, and there's um, so a blog post that I with a video that I use to build this is linked to the waste loop blog post as well. Um, and then when you, when they do migrate to the upper bucket, could you just use the black gold in the lower bucket or is there a lot of sifting of worms out? Uh, so I had, I haven't tried it yet, um, but I'll let you know, <laughs> <laughs> come all, check in throughout the summer. <laughs> there will almost certainly be some worms in there because they, they like to, they, they like to explore. They're really mm -hmm. like, they're curious. But so there'll be just a few to pick out as opposed to when I have to do it and there's, you know, hundreds. So it'll be a lot easier. I think these systems are a lot easier. How do you know when to stack a new bucket on top? For me, it's just when it starts to get full, essentially. Um, and, and if you're just ready to let that process and, you know, you kind of want to, it might be that you want to use it for something. And so you want to just hurry up that process and not keep adding to it. For me, it's just that it, I can tell it's kind of getting toward the top and yeah, ready for a new one. And there's no sure. I could let it only get half full and, you know, they come with four of them or something like that, or you could do, you know, buckets to the ceiling. It's just whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it really is like Dana said. When you need it, it's there. It's just a matter of getting it and using it. And if you don't need it, you let it sit. Mm -hmm. Or what I do, I tend to scoop it out and keep it somewhere else. 
um, before it gets too full. My bin is really full right now. It's probably time in a couple of weeks, but then I'll have plenty for the growing season. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks, Loop, to San Juan CW. And yeah, come on up to see the yes. close, close up. And thank mm -hmm. you, virtual friends, too. Yeah, if you haven't seen the worms yet, has anyone seen them? Are they hanging out? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to try to.